Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, it reads, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies and on them that hate thee, which persecuted thee. And that thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command thee this day. And the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thy hand, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy land, for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good, as he rejoiceth over thy fathers. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, and if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, for this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea to, for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do us it. See, I have set before thee this day life and good, and, good, and death and evil. Now, I want, want to just focus on that contrast, life and good and death and evil. And that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the, in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon this land, upon the land whither thou passest over Jordan to go possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Continuing on the subject of the end of the beginning, and the uh, title includes the phrase, now it's complicated. And I'm hoping to uh, wrap up um, this particular part on now it's complicated. But just to use a few uh, things here at the outset to recapture where we were on Sunday morning, uh, we were examining how we're not living in an innocent world. And I think that that's, uh, that's a phrase that has a lot of meaning to it, innocent, not just in the, the likeness of an innocent child, but rather just in terms of things being very simple, being very straightforward. So we're not living in an innocent world. It's a world with dishonest motives. And we looked at that, how questions can be asked and things can be done. It's a world that has dishonest objectives. And we are taught that behind everything, there is a spirit, motive, and objective. And that is anything, everything. And there's not very many things, even though they may be inanimate in themselves, if they're a product of the creative process, if it's something that man has invented or something that man has designed, then there's some motive, spirit, and objective behind that. So there's many different traps and pitfalls that we have to avoid. And at the very least, there's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of things that kind of get our attention and kind of get us excited. So we have to be very careful in the day and age that we're living in uh, to not reach that tipping point or that spot where we spill over on the other side uh, of modesty or moderation or give ourselves into things that can distract us. And we've been uh, wanting to emphasize this in the last couple services, a few services, that we face choices. And when we, whenever we make a choice, there's a consequence. So we're facing choices and subsequent consequences that are the product of the end of the beginning. That in Genesis chapter 3, when man was tempted and fell, or the woman was tempted and mankind fell, uh, we now today are facing many different choices and the consequences from our own decisions that go back to that time and instance in the beginning. And, and maybe to some of us, it's kind of an obvious statement, but then for others, it might be like, well, how can you tie everything back to that? The life that we're living now is not the same life that we're they were living in Genesis 1 and 2. And so there's a, something that has been brought upon mankind by virtue of the fall. And we're reminded that we're living in Satan's Eden, not God's Eden. And not just 
the uh, beginning of Satan's Eden that we can read in Genesis 4, even through uh, chapter uh, 12 uh, and 11 and there, where we can begin to see just the unfolding after, um, after the Garden of Eden. We're not living in those times. We're living not in the beginning of Satan's Eden, but in the climax of it where everything that mankind has been doing is accumulating and maturing and growing, and it's coming to a particular place here in the end where the, uh, the Satan's Eden is blooming, it's blossoming, it's coming to its climax and to its fullness. And so we're, we want to keep that in mind. We're not living in God's Eden, we're living in Satan's Eden. And Satan's approach in the garden was to use a question, kind of, and it's used symbolically in Scripture, but yet he opens it up with the questions, the serpent approaching him, of the woman and using a question to provoke thought, to kind of provoke a conversation. And the language of that question is used symbolically in the scripture. And then he follows up the question with a lie. So he uses a question, he uses a lie. And he's offering all knowledge, as we said last time, without context. He's using, he's using knowledge now in such a way to where uh, he wants to ask a question, he wants to get thoughts, maybe provide a few facts, but he's doing it without the proper context that if she acts upon this, this is actually what's really going to happen. And he kind of hides that part from it, and he frames it in a way that's a little bit more easy to swallow. And if he did that then in the beginning, how do you think things are now? If that was his drive in the beginning, if that was his approach in the beginning, that was the way he was going to go about it in the beginning, then we're kind of reaching the age where Satan feels like he's kind of hit his stride. And it feels like he's hit his groove and, and he's got it figured out. He's been studying mankind for 6,000 years. And so he's using these same tactics. And the world is trained in these tactics to bring confusion and complication to people's lives. And want, we've wanted to look at the challenge that the woman faced in the garden this way. The woman was presented with the choice that she never had to, was never supposed to make. She had been given the word of God, and God had made the choice for her. The word of God had told her, don't you eat of it, for that day that you eat thereof, that's the day that you die. So she was not supposed to be put into the position where she would consider it. She wasn't supposed to be in the position to even ponder it. So Satan put her in the place where now she's considering an alternative. She's beginning to wonder about it. She's trying to figure her way out through this. And it's through that question and the subsequent lie attached to it that she, begins, she gets ensnared. She's trapped. We use the word entangled. And so as looking at things as complicated, we're talking about things that are not clear or confusing. Even things that seem unpredictable or irrational. There's no consistency to it. There's no clear rules of, of approaching it. No order to approach it. And so when we look at something that's complex, it may be confusing to us. It may seem complicated to us. But yet somebody who knows the organism, somebody that knows that flight deck, as we use the example on Sunday, we have that Dreamliner flight deck there for you, Brother James, for you to take a look at in the slide that we use that you could look at it and immediately to a captain, they're like, oh, look, everything's just right where it needs to be. Isn't this nice? And to us, it could be explained as to where we may be able to begin to understand. Oh, well, that's why they put that there. And that's why they put that there. And that's the difference between something that can be complex. Whereas something's complicated, study it all you want. If somebody's made it complicated, you may not be able to figure it out. If it's intentionally meant to be deceiving, there may be no rationale at the end of the day that you come to and say, well, I figured it out. And I'm sure you've experienced that before where um, you're asked to do something and it's based upon some uh, assumptions or you assume certain things about it and you begin to take place in, in figuring it out or putting it together or, or doing something and you realize, oh, well, I didn't have all the pieces to the puzzle. I didn't, have, uh, I didn't have all the information that I needed to have in order to begin in this. And that's what makes things complicated when things are incomplete, things are not, pre uh, not as they are presented to you. So rules and order and structure and the word of God is meant to put us, uh, uh, to bring, uh, uh, though it may be complex and there's many facets to it, it's to give us something to be very simple towards, uh, something that we can believe in and walk in to remove all the complexity of life and to avoid the complications. And the very word complicated means to weave together like a web or to entangle. And we looked at scriptures how that the affairs of this life seek to entangle uh, our minds and our attention and draw away our resources. And what's the conclusion in Ecclesiastes? Vanity. The things that entangle us, the things that dominate our minds, the things that draw us away from what is important, those things are vanity. And so that's the world that we're living in. We're living in a world that's not innocent, but our minds are not innocent. 
Our minds and emotions can betray us. Our feelings can deceive us. And there's things that we really, really want because we think we're going to enjoy it. We don't enjoy it when we get it. Or things that we thought were beneficial and things that we thought were harmless can eventually be not to our benefit and actually harmful. And that's our feelings and our emotions and our passions that betray us. We could just do a simple memory experiment right now tonight just to show how often our memory fails us. They did a study and they asked, uh, I think it was thousands of people, they asked them to describe the moment that they saw the, the first plane on September 11th, 2001 strike the, uh, the towers. And hundreds of them, if not thousands, could distinctly remember on September 11th, viewing and watching the first, on TV, watch the first airplane strike the towers. Now, I could do the test right now and ask how many remember that. On September 11th, watching that first plane hit the tower. And you all are very, very wise to not raise your hands because that video didn't come out till later. But the, your memory fails you. It, it turns it into a film room and they'll take a snippet of something later and insert it into another memory. And you create a film on September 11th. Oh, I remember I was there at Starbucks and I remember they had it on the screen. And we all gathered around and watched the first tower strike the first plane strike the tower, and you don't even realize how kind of crazy that was that you all got around the TV at that moment, you know, to watch a, the first plane hit the towers, but yet our minds fail us. It tricks us. It confuses us. And so those are some things that we were mentioning on Sunday, just how much that our minds uh, entrap us and betray us. And so we have complicated world and a complicated heart. And this complicated heart, it's, for, it's very easy to get wrapped up in many different issues and problems and questions and scenarios that just create tension. It becomes a dilemma to us and ultimately it results in our unhappiness. Can you say amen to that? These are the things that happen in a world that's very complicated and then we have hearts that are complicated. And we were looking at a statement that Brother Branham made at the very end of the message on, uh, that we were ministering on Sunday, how uh, that Brother Branham says that every hospital, every siren sung, every death that ever died, every struggle, every man on the battlefield, every poor little sick aff afflicted baby was caused by disbelieving just one word of God's word. And we want to take the opposite in that. If we believe in our hearts that the, the fall of mankind began by disobedience to the word and disbelieving God's word, and really, I mean, that's a comfort level. Just put it in that way because all of Christendom, Christendom will admit and at least confess that the fall in the beginning can be characterized as disobeying God's word. So if disobedience to God's word caused every sickness, every heartache, every difficult situation that we face today, then that is the clue to us how to make it through to overcome or to resolve every sickness, every difficult situation, every heartache is through believing the word of God. So God actually uses the fall as a lesson to us that if the fall is caused by disbelieving, if the fall is caused by disobedience, then our access to peace and our access to joy and our access to overcoming the complexes of this life will be found in believing God's word, Amen. taking God at his word and obeying his word. But ever since the fall, as you see the different things that Brother Branham mentions here, hospitals and death and struggles and battlefields, this is a fallen world, and with the fallen mind, we're trying to navigate through the minefield that is life, and it's just a complicated maze. Life becomes a complicated maze, because as soon as it seems like you're done with one task, there's always another. I was thinking of even the, the Greek uh, fable where the one, uh, the Scythian, or, that had to push the rock up the hill only for it to roll back, roll back down again. And what did he do? He did that repetitively. And it really is, that fable is really speaks to the truth of humanity, where that's what we're stuck doing day after day after day. As soon as even one task seems to be finished and you've accomplished it, and then you roll that rock up the hill, if you get it up the hill, there's another task. There's another one that you have to face and you have to accomplish. That's this, now it's complicated. That's the life that we live now. And we were looking at John chapter 12 and Luke chapter 10. And uh, Mary and Martha and the curious question of Judas is maybe a way I'd like to refer to it. How you had these different actors in this drama, even Lazarus being one that sat at the table to fellowship with Jesus. But you had Mary in her home, Martha in her home, and Martha offering this worship to Jesus and breaking this expensive ointment and pouring it out, out onto his feet and using, uh, using this worship of this spikenard. And Judas asking the question of you know, we could have sold that for 300 pence, and that 300 pence could have supported a poor family for an entire year. Don't you think we could have made better use of that oil? 
And if we just measured it on the basis of what was logical, what would do the most good to the greater, the greater number of humanity, which is ethics, usually strives to resolve what's the best option. And they come up with this rule that whatever would do the greater good to the greater number is the mo most ethical outcome. And that guides a lot of disciplines because you, you're faced with a task. What should you do? Have you, any, any of you been challenged with the, uh, the uh, railroad scenario where you have a train go uh, a, 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 a train going down a particular track and it's lost its brakes and if it stays on that track it's going to run into a very crowded area of a city center that's going to kill hundreds of lives but if you change its direction it's going to go down a track that's being worked on and there's a maintenance crew of four people that are working if you change it then the train will be redirected down that path and only four people will die and you're the one that's responsible for switching for throwing the switch and determining which way it goes now what would you do and in order to try to figure that out, you'd have to start rationalizing. Well, if it just stays on the track it's going, that's the outcome that would have been if I don't intervene. So is it more ethical to allow things just to continue to unfold as it has been and let the consequences be what they may? Or should I intervene? Is it a morally, am I morally required as a greater ethics to change the direction of it and only allow a few lives to perish in saving the many? Has anybody heard that, uh, that ethical challenge before? I think they might teach it in, even in, in just uh, L, uh, middle school. And it's a very challenging ethical question. And I think it's resolved by saying that some of the philosophers resolved it by saying that what you would do is you make the decision that would result in the greater good for the greater number of people. And Judas, in some ways, is even dealing with that ethical dilemma. Like, wouldn't it have been better to do this? And you could quickly get sucked into that argument and agree, wow, we should support the poor. We should visit the widow and the, and the fatherless and their affliction, and we ought to give. And these are things that we're required to do as Christians. And so maybe what we do is we just tell Martha to cool it a little bit, don't use as much, sell the rest, and support a family. But what you don't realize is you've been tricked into questioning one's worship of Jesus Christ. You've been tricked into questioning what one ought to give to the Lord. You've been tricked into questioning and devaluing what is the right thing and what is the good thing. And so the world rep is represented by Judas, who kind of asked that question, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, because he had ulterior motives. He had something else he was trying to accomplish. And then Martha, Mary would represent even, excuse me, now that I've, um, Mary's the one that, uh, then in Luke chapter 10, Martha's the one that's washing his feet. Martha's the one that's pouring out the worship. And if you look at chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, we'll just kind of go through it very quickly so we can make a little bit better time tonight. The question that Mary asked is the question that our hearts can ask. So Judas would represent the world trying to provoke our hearts to reason and science and knowledge and facts. But then also our hearts can become encumbered. And it tells us that when they, Jesus had come into their home, it was Mary who was cumbered about much serving. And she went about trying to serve and get the dishes ready and get the meal cooked and get everything ready and all the, all the duties that would come with domestic life and hosting a very important guest. And she goes to Jesus and she asks a different question. Jesus, do you not care that my sister has left me alone to serve, but yet she sits at your feet not helping? And even this question from our heart seems to uh, would be one that we could wrestle with and say, yes, domestic duties must be done and household affairs have to be uh, attended to. And there's things that we've got to be uh, conscious of and things that we have a moral duty to. This is our own hearts that can now be provoked to ask a question. But Jesus rebukes her and says, Martha, Martha, this is in verse 41, thou art careful and troubled about many things. Many things, not just even the household order, not just even serving. She was cumbered, which means she was drawn away. She was distracted in her mind. When it says cumbered about much serving, it was a duty that she was required to do, but it, it, it had entangled her. She was not just busy, she became too busy. And when, you, when you're busy, that's fine. We're all busy. But when you get too busy, that means it's at the expense of something else that's more necessary. It's so when something else is suffering as a result of the busyness. And he, he says, you're troubled about too many things. He says, but one thing is needful. One thing is necessary is actually the thing that he's saying. There's only one thing necessary. And Mary hath chosen that one thing that is necessary. Mary hath chosen that good part. And it's that good part, the one thing that is needful, the one thing that is necessary, which shall not be taken away from her. And so she had chosen the proper thing. She had chosen the right way. She had, 
She had, Martha had taken the thing which was the most important and had done that first. And this is what, what Mary struggled with is uh, the much serving and the demands of life. And it's applicable to us in our lives to choose the better part, to choose the right thing, to put God first, to, to take that simple faith towards the word of God first and then let that kind of become the barometer for you or the, uh, the needle that you're following, the thing that's given you your direction. And I read a statement here recently by a philosopher, Democrates, who said, the cause of sinning is ignorance of what is better. The reason why man sins is because he's ignorant of what is best. The reason that man sins is because he forgets, is not knowledgeable or conscious of and not remembering what is better. The cause of sin is ignorance or failure to remember or to recall what is best. And it says here that Martha had chosen the one thing that was necessary or the better part, the good part, the one thing necessary. And so we sin, we fall short of the word of God when we forget what is necessary. We fall short of the word of God when we forget the one thing that is needful or the better part. And so considering our complicated world and our complicated hearts, it's very important that we know the word of God, that we know the will of God, or that we know and hold to the good part. That we know and hold good, hold fast to the one thing that is necessary. Now that has just been some things just to kind of catch us up to where we were Sunday morning. And I, I realize now I took a great portion of this evening service to do that. But we stopped at Luke chapter 8 verse 14. And we wanted to use this as an example Sunday morning, and we ran out of time. So we're just going to pick up here. And Jesus is giving the parable of the sower. We know the sower is the word. In this particular instance, the word is sown, and the word being sown finds place in different types of ground. The word seed, when it gets in good ground, it grows to perfection. The other places of the uh, of the 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 by the wayside and the stony ground, those represent certain complications certain dispositions of the heart, certain circumstances that did not allow the seed to come forth. But when it comes to the ground which had uh, with thorns in it, it's important to note that it wasn't so much about what was in the, what the ground, the type of ground, but what else was in the ground. So it, I want you to view it, it's otherwise good ground, but yet something else is in that ground that competes with the good word. And so it says, that which fell among thorns, which we know is the word is the seed, the seed which fell among thorns, are they, when they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures in this life and bring no fruit to perfection. So there's nothing wrong with the seed. There's really nothing wrong with the ground. There's just the presence of other things in the ground where the seed is growing, the word is growing, that competes with the nutrients, the life the light and the water for that seed to come to its perfection. And so Jesus just paints a beautiful picture of our own lives by bringing this image before us of seed being sown into the ground, but there being other seeds that are already present in it that compete against the word and make the word ineffective. Because I like you to think of it this way. There's nothing wrong with your ground in itself because it's ordained of God and there's nothing wrong with the word. So if you don't see fruit, don't question the word. Don't question your own heart or your own calling or your own election. You can begin to look elsewhere and identify where are the thorns? Where are the foreign things in my garden that are competing with the word, that are defiling my ground? Because if I can deal with those, then I can deal with the things that are hindering the true expression of the word. Amen. And so he lists these three, three things. I was looking at even today of this un unholy trinity of the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. The cares and riches and pleasures of this life. I believe it's in Mark or Matthew where it's referred to as the, the, the deceitfulness of riches. So it's not just riches, but the deceitfulness of it. And the cares speaks of anxiety and stress. It, even the word that's used means you're divided. So you, you, you feel that you're being stretched out. You feel you're being pressed. You, need, you should be doing this. You should be doing that. So the cares is like a division of all your energy and all your efforts and all your mind. You just feel, you feel pressed. And riches, it speaks of an abundance of possessions. And pleasures, it's the, the desire for more, a lust for more. So Jesus is saying that good word is sowed into good ground, but stress and anxiety, abundance of possessions, and the desire or lust for more compete against the word that's trying to grow in our hearts and cause it to bring no fruit to perfection. And so full maturity of our Christian character, the full maturity of this word which we received into our hearts, 
it's important to resolve these things that are in our hearts and in our lives, the cares, the riches, and the pleasures of this life that inhibit the growth of the true nature and character of Christ. And this is so for every single one of us that, 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 uh, that receives the word of God. These things are fighting against us and they may have different manifestations in other people's lives. You know, some people may be very rich and a lot of us don't have that privilege or curse, however you want to look at it. Uh, somebody told me the story one time, or we were familiar with the story that Brother Branham said that he was offered a million dollars and he said no and turned it down. And this brother was saying, I couldn't handle the temptation. And I thought, well, I might want the chance. You know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, just... Just, let's just see how I do. And if it's not going good, take it, take it, hurry. But uh, that's, that's just our carnal thinking. But yet, so different things could reflect differently in different people's hearts. So this anxiety and stress, this being divided, and even these abundance of possessions and the desire for more. Now notice, let's look now at what Brother Branham wrote in the Church Age book. And I'll just, uh, I'll just make a public apology. I'm just still maybe not quite used to our, our new surroundings. So if I seem nervous or fidgety, or I'm just not quite hitting the mark in my delivery, pray for me. I'm still getting used to our new surroundings. I'm kind of like maybe a dog in a new house, just not right, not sure where to go, and I'm still sniffing everything. Right, Eliza? Kind of a little nervous, like a a dog in a house, new house, a new home, trying to get used to it. So I'm sorry if I'm making you uncomfortable with my nerves. Uh, But we looked at this statement last week, and maybe even the week before. Each age had its pressure. Pressures. For example, a great burden of the last age is the pressure of riches, soft living, and nervous tensions in a complex age that we seem unfitted to live in. Now remember, this is a toxic combination for deceitful hearts. This is something that for our own hearts as they're made and the deceitful above all things and desperately wicked and, and can mislead us. Here we have a very toxic combination that we live in a world with a heart that's easily impressionable. A heart that longs, a heart that remembers, a heart that can be deceiving and lead us in the wrong path and and is desperately wicked. It's sick, it's longing, it desires to have things in this age. This burden that we carry in this age then is pressure of riches, soft living, and nervous tensions. And I see them as leading one to another. You have the pressures of riches, the things you want to acquire and accumulate. And as we accumulate them, it increases our soft living. We rely more upon them. And maybe just to use harmless example, a harmless example, just so that we can begin to think about how easily we're impacted by this. But just think of how you would live without air conditioning in the valley. And really, there's some people that would testify. I think Brother Paul Lovell could give us a lesson or two about how when they first moved here to the valley, there was no air conditioning. And they lived just out in the desert and they didn't they didn't have those things. And we're thinking, how could you do it? Well, the reason why it's so hard on us, eh, let's just admit it, it's probably soft living. Right? We've gotten used to it. Our money can buy it. It's something that has acclimated us to a different climate, even when it's really, really hot out. And so the pressure of riches, the more things we acquire, the softer we're living. And then that creates the nervous tensions because you're always worried about it, whether you're going to miss out on something else, whether or not you have enough. Or am I living as soft as I can? Could I live softer? Is there a way to make my life a little bit easier? And we may have never asked ourselves the question when we pondered whether or not we should upgrade to the new the new cell phone. But in some ways, we're a little bit worried about whether or not our life is getting harder because of the device we're carrying in our hands. And we could make it a little bit easier if we just upgraded. Right. If I just had a little bit bigger house, if I just had a little bit more of that. And so these things kind of connect to one another. And then they have this perfect parallel to what Jesus says, that the this word of God is being choked out by cares, this, the nervous tensions, the riches, the pressure of riches and soft living, the pleasures of this life. These things have a perfect parallel one with another, even to the pride of life, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. The temptations in the garden, the temptation to Jesus, this unholy trinity, which all that is in the world is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Jesus is the cares and riches and the pleasures of this life are all things that fight against the word and the perfection of it. I would even say it this way, the perfect manifestation of it, because I wouldn't question, I wouldn't want to question your experience, your faith, and the seed of God that's inside of you, and the word that you're feeding on, it's going to come to perfection, but we can, uh, we can kind of shake ourselves and waken ourselves to realize if we're not seeing it, it's because things are intervening, right. things are pressuring it, things are complicating it, things are getting in the way of that perfect expression of the word. And we saw that even mankind, because of their endless questions, 
Ecclesiastes 7.29, I believe it was. They're endless questions, endless uh, meddling of questions and figuring things out. Jesus saying, cares, riches, and pleasures of this life, the, 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 the pressures of riches, the soft living leads to nervous tensions. Why? Because it's a, a desire for more. We need to have. We need to stay abreast. We need to keep up. We need to be in the know. It causes these endless questions. And I mentioned it a few times on Sunday, and I really wanted to amplify it in a greater detail. And I feel that I'm just going to mention it and kind of hit the top of it and skip on. But the power of the fear of regret is overwhelming. This is a tremendous power. It's called the fear of missing out. It's also called the fear of a better option. So FOMO or FOBO or the fear of regret. Those are the different ways that it's referred to. And it's so powerful that it overwhelms us. And in many ways, the very thing that struck the heart of the woman, it was an emotion she had never experienced before, but Satan caused the fear of missing out. The fear of a better option, the fear of something better, something on the other side that God had hidden her from, that he didn't want her to know, and caused this wrestling in her heart. And that was all he had to do to get her to act because she was afraid she'd be missing out. And this phenomenon is pervasive across many people's lives, especially as we become more connected through social media, is you have this perpetual, endless fear of missing out because somebody else is doing this and somebody else is doing that, and you're no longer oblivious to it. They're telling you about it. You're hearing about it. You're connected to it, and you see so much of the world, and you hear so much about what's being discussed. You hear so much about what's being offered and what's available, and you become gripped with this fear. Am I missing out socially? Am I missing out on friendship? And we can be afraid to do what we know the Word of God says we should do, but we don't act because we're afraid of what we'll lose when we do it. It's the fear of loss, and that's a very, very powerful force that's connected with this fear of regret. I don't want to risk it losing what I have, so I'll just stick with what I've got. Even in that parable of the talents, that one that was given the one, he said, well, I knew you were an austere man. I knew that you would, be, you would really get me if I lost it. So I just put it to the money chain, or I just buried it and made sure that I had the one you gave me when I gave it back. What did he do? He was afraid of losing something, so he wouldn't even do what he knew, what he knew his master would have wanted him to do. He said, you should have just given it to the money changers, and I could have got interest on it. And so this fear of missing out, this fear of losing friends, this fear of losing fellowship, this fear of losing money, this fear of losing an opportunity, and the fear of not getting a promotion. Oh, you, I could just keep going on and on and on until I get everybody to say amen. So here's your chance. Everybody in, court, in unity. Amen. All right, you want me to move on? I get it. But the fear of whatever it might be will keep you from, move, keep, keep you from acting because you're afraid of what you'll lose. It's exactly what caused the woman to act in disobedience to the word of God is that fear of missing out. So it can paralyze you to obey God's word or it can motivate you to disobey God's word. Such a powerful, powerful force. And as it worked with the woman in the garden, as Jesus is mentioning, as even Mar Martha wrestled with it, this confusion or this lack of knowledge of what is best this confusion on what is best, this confusion on what is good, this lack of knowledge of what is better or more needful or more necessary for happiness is where we fail. Jesus is touching on it. In Luke chapter 8, it's touched on in Luke chapter 10. Even I would say that's what this philosopher said. The reason why man sins is because he doesn't know what is best. So I said, God, help us to recognize how these, this unholy trinity is pressing on us, choking on us, and confusing us. I know it's very, very simple, but yet once you begin to look at it, it becomes very, very practical. And if we believe that we have been given a word that's doing, going to lead us to triumph and overcoming and victory and, and, and mature sons and daughters of God to fulfill the promises of this age, then it's very practical to look at the things that keep this word from expressing itself. It should give us a lot of grace for people that we know that profess to believe truth who don't always act appropriately and we could just have grace saying there just must be a lot of weeds, weeds, not weed, a lot of weeds in their life. That just me, must be what it is. There just must be some things that are choking it out. They, I, they can't be Christ-like. They can't get out of their own way. They can't show the love of God. They can't do the things that are right. They can't humble themselves. Just have a grace to say, you know what? Just with a little bit more gardening, just a little bit more weeding, a little bit more work, may God just have his way in that person's life till we can start seeing that sensitivity of Christ, the humility of Christ, the love for the word, and that maturing that we long for ourselves and we have the grace for others to meet the same mark. 
And so this, as it's mentioned in the, in the one place in the Bible, of the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word of God so that it brings no fruit to perfection, cares, riches, and pleasures of this life. Notice how it's dealt with in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. Because the deceitfulness of riches and these cares and pleasures, it's the, it's, they have an emptiness that will never fulfill their promise. That's why it's the deceitfulness of riches. That's why Solomon said, I had it all and it didn't work. And I had my wisdom and it still didn't work. Just as it happened to the fool, it happened to me. So riches are deceitful because we may even right now be thinking that the promise of this benefit of $3,000 per person once a year or another stimulus check or, or a raise, we could be telling ourselves, if I could only get that, things will be better. And, and I will walk with you at least in that to some degree. Yes, that may help and that may, be, uh, may make things better, but it won't be the best or what you need unless you recognize and are founded upon the one thing that is needful. Unless you have chosen the one thing that is necessary. And if you have chosen the one thing that is necessary, then God could take a small seed of a stimulus check. He could take a small seed of a promotion. He could take a small seed of your own discipline to honor the word of God and make a difficult decision in your home and, and, and remove things from your life that you know are toxic. He, you can honor that decision if you've received the one thing that is necessary to bring blessings to you and multiply a fruit in your life and really, really lead you and guide you and you can experience a joy from that but if you don't have the one thing that is necessary those things can either be wasted or become curses to you and so these these deceitfulness of riches and this this emptiness of pleasure they never fulfill the promise and and i love to think of it this way they never will truly ever satisfy a child of god and that's why sometimes david would even ponder and those that that uh, wrote the psalms they would always think you know what it's just it's just really remarkable how that this works for others, but it doesn't work for me. How can they glory and how can they have this and how can they have that? It, it's, it's God. God has orchestrated it such. Ultimately, your satisfaction is going to come through him and him alone because he wants it that way. And you say, well, that doesn't, that doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem fair. Well, whatever God says is truth and whatever God does is just. So if he wants to have you, he's going to have you and that's fair. We just agree to that. So that's just, if that's what God wants, it's fair. And it doesn't operate by our rules uh, of, of engagement and our rules of warfare and our world, rules of economy. It's whatever God wants. So he's, he's put you in a particular, he's made you in such a way to what the world can get away with, you may not be able to get away with it. Even a, a young brother in our church here had a situation where he bought, he bought, a, um, he bought a cell phone um, from, on offer up or something like that and they were he was told it was a it wasn't stolen it would work the number wasn't blacklisted he got it it worked for a little bit and then soon, certain thing it stopped working and then they he, they found out that it was blacklisted and so this phone is no longer going to work and someone said well just how did you get the phone well, i bought it on offer up well then just sell it again on offer up <laughs> if that's what happened to you just do it again and he was convicted in his heart he's like well no i don't want to I don't want to be dishonest. I at least know for sure now that this isn't going to work. Maybe the first guy didn't really know. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. But I can't be clear in my heart to turn around and perpetuate fraud on somebody else. And that's the, that's the kind of uh, uh, things that a child of God learns that, they, that they're to do and the ways to honor God. And you know what? Somebody in the world can do it and get away with it. But I tell you, a son of God do that, it'll haunt them. It'll chase after them. You, you, can't, you can't skim and get by and cheat and try to do, do work. I, we're even experienced this with respect to homeschools, things as simple as homeschool. You think you can get away with skating by and not doing your work as a son of God, it will, a daughter of God, it will haunt you. You wonder why things are so chaotic because you know deep down inside the dishonesty, the lack of integrity, the truthfulness haunts a child of God. It's almost as if the world doesn't have that ear. They, they become more callous, they become more crude, they become more dishonest because they don't have that consciousness of conviction. So it says here, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. This is how humanity, this age, the Laodicean age, boasts of itself. 
We see ourselves. I want you to take this phrase. I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. This is the boast of the Laodicean age. This is the boast of all humanity in the world we're living in now. All governments, all politicians, all economics, all societies. This is the spirit upon the entire age. I don't care if you want to find me a civilization uh, uh, living out in the middle of nowhere. The spirit pervades. They are materially wealthy and they are ethical. They are more ethical. They are more... uh, Uh, They're more equipped and better able to make decisions. We are rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. Rich. Brother Branham talks about how this is wealthy in the things of this world. That's what he characterizes it as when he examines this phrase. They're wealthy in the things of this world. I am rich. I'm wealthy in the things of this world. I'm abounding in material uh, resources and possessions. I have a lot. I have a lot. That characterizes this age, increased with goods. Now, Brother Brandon takes this and looks at it in a little bit different light. And the words that are used in the Greek would even suggest uh, this meaning that the world is looking at their spiritual riches. Now, not with the capital S, like the godly riches and godly wisdom, but the spiritual riches, riches that relate to religion and, and formal worship and even a better morality. They have spiritual riches that as men, we've obtained to a better morality. We are more ethical. We look back on ages past and look how they treated this person and look how society perpetuated genocides and look how minorities were treated and they look at the evils that men have perpetuated on other men throughout generations and thousands and thousands of years and now they assume themselves to be more ethical and, and have higher spiritual attainments to where now they can rightly divide between what is just and what is unjust and we can defend the poor and we can defend the minorities and we can defend those uh, and, and look, don't look at differences and And so they're feeling that they're more superior ethically. They have a higher sense of justice. This is the age that we're living in. They have a better morality, higher spiritual attainments. Now, this is so within the Christendom, and they feel that they have more spiritual services. They have better wisdom and better word. And uh, and I I don't mean to make Brother Joel kind of a focus focus of the sermon tonight, but he sent me, Brother Joel Rowe sent me a, a, a picture this past week of how a I don't know where it came from, but it was a particular church that said what the Bible is not. And they had an X next to, it's not the word of God. And an X next to, it's not infallible. An X next to these different things that you would say, well, okay, that's interesting. That's exactly what the Bible says it is. So, and then they, and then they begin to describe it in such a way to where now it became more of a guide, something that was more of a community text. And we all kind of participate in it because it's instructive to whoever we are, regardless of our belief system and how we really want to live and what challenges we face. So it's just kind of a community text that we, we can use to help navigate this world. And this is how the world, even in Christendom and nominal Christianity, feels that they're even more spiritual now because they've let go of certain things in the Word of God. They've let go of certain controversial things and they've attained to something that's more harmonious or homo- homogenous that we can all kind of fellowship in and we can have services to where you just come as you are, stay as you are, live how you are, believe what you are. We're just kind of getting together to hang out for 45 minutes. Hope you like the music, right? I mean, that's all it's become. And he says, I have need of nothing. So here's, I'm rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. It means I have everything or I don't want anymore. That's what it means. I have everything or I don't want anymore. Now, what's remarkable about this, these I am rich, increased with goods, and I have everything or I don't want anymore. They're deceived in this proclamation that I don't want anymore. Because the Bible says you don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They think they're rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. But they don't know that, in fact, they're naked, blind, poor, wretched, and miserable. They don't have that knowledge of even the better part that they would be clothed and that they would be able to see. So they're deceived when they say that either I have everything, I've had enough, or I don't want any more because their actions don't fit their confession. They're constantly being driven for more, constantly desirous of more, constantly trying to pursue things, to have more, pursue to have more, pursue to have more. And Solomon had every material possession or comfort that man could desire, but still he felt empty. And the Bible says, know us not. You're not fully aware that you're driven by emptiness. You're driven by nakedness. You're driven by what you lack. You have an insatiable greed for more. Don't you know that you're poor, miserable, blind, and naked? And it's actually those things that motivate their action. That's why a man who could have so much, have so much abundance, but still prey on the vulnerable to get more. 
Because no matter what, how much he has in his possession, he still desires to take away from the other. What motivates him? The reality that he's poor. The reality that he's miserable. The reality that he's blind and naked. Not, I'm rich, I don't need anything else. But yet they act contrary to that confession because they, they're full of greed. Full of a, a desire, a lust for more. If this was true, we'd kind of just stay right where we were at the beginning of the 20th century and we wouldn't have gone as far as we have. Because man would have been satisfied. I'm rich, I'm increased with goods, I have need of nothing. We just kind of would have been, been holding where we were in the roaring 20s. Right? right? right. We'd be experiencing yet another roaring 20s. But the first part had not supplied the second part. The first part, I'm rich, increased with goods and have need of nothing, has not placated the second part. The nakedness, the, mis the misery, the poorness. And it cannot, the first part cannot bring fulfillment. It cannot bring happiness. So Brother Branham makes this conclusion as he's examined Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. It cries that it has a great amplitude of all things, but it keeps burning with desire like an unsatisfied fire. Is that not the age we live in? It cries, it boasts, it brags that we have an amplitude of all things. We have so much, we have so much, but yet it keeps burning with a desire like an unsatisfied fire. Why don't they just make a phone that never slows down, that once you spend $1,000 for it, as long as you don't break it, it'll work that way forever? Why doesn't it work that way? Because the one making it wants to make more money. So they actually build within the device itself a ticking clock that through regular updates, eventually it'll be operating so slowly and can't work with new apps and can't even work on its own operating system that the company designed it for to where you need a new one and it creates this desire in you. I'm missing out. I got to have more. I got to have the next one. And you get sucked into the upgrade cycle. Why is it that mankind, mankind can't be happy with the amplitude of all things? Because he's burning with an unsatisfied fire. Abraham Maslow said, man is a perpetually wanting animal. Man is a perpetually wanting animal. That's what mankind is. Perpetually wanting. All right, I'm going to skip. I'm going to skip more to try to, uh, to keep from being lengthy tonight. I, I, I feel that there's such a, just a wonderful, uh, wonderful atmosphere. I enjoy, the, uh, I enjoy the pool and the expectation that you have when you come to church. And as I've said before, I'm still getting used to it, to calibrate just how lengthy these things go. These things, what a way to refer to a church service, but the preaching of the word. And so I'm going to skip a little bit, and I want, I'm going to read this statement that Brother Brandon makes, because he says how that uh, this burning with an unsatisfied fire. And so the things that I'm skipping, I, let me just say this, maybe just to kind of, and don't pull me into it. I don't want to get to it. It's going to be too lengthy if I do. But we're no longer living in what I would call the information age alone. But now it's coming into the age of experience where our in information has sucked us into a mode where now we want to experience the things that we're being learning about, the things that's being presented to us. And so there's different statements that Brother Branham makes and things that we could share with you to see that how Satan's knowledge without the wisdom of the word is destructive, it's deceiving, and that it brings forth this, even as it worked within the woman, it created a lust of knowledge. And then once she had this knowledge lust excited within her, the knowledge was not enough. It was a lust for experience. And it brought her into a particular way of acting. And so I, I want you to deeply ponder that and consider that, that Satan's motive is to create a lust for knowledge. And in gaining knowledge, it creates a lust for the experience. Now, if you can consider that very deeply for a moment and just think, how could you ever crave something and want something? If you never knew of its existence. And you say, well, Brother Aaron, I can still have a craving for something because the need's there and the desire's there. I concede. How could you ever fulfill it until you found the thing that could fulfill it? And so Satan has a means of uh, making you aware of something and now becoming aware of it, begin to work within your mind to try to bring you to a place that now that I know that it's there, I, want to des I, I desire to, to enjoy it. I desire to have it. I desire to want it. 
And that's the, that's the problem many times in just the casual conversations that we can have with people, that if we're not careful, you can glorify sin or glorify something, even your own past. You begin to talk about the effects of a particular drug. And on somebody who's not born again, they can start to think, does it really do that? Wow, that is pretty trippy. And by knowledge of it, now the devil can begin to work upon them to experience it. And if you begin to look at your life and the things that you wrestle with, the things that you struggle with, and even the, the, the standard that you want to keep in your own home and the way that you want to measure your, your relationship to your wife and to your children, that Satan's MO is to give you knowledge of it and then to want to give you the lust to experience it. Right. And I say, let's just keep it clean. Let's keep it clean so that he's not giving us the knowledge. Therefore, we're having to bite, fight in the battleground of experience and trying to hold off on the experience. And it's, it's that, that scenario of actually just putting the cake there in front of you and telling yourself, don't eat it, don't eat it, don't eat it, don't eat it. How about just get rid of the cake? Wasn't that God's wisdom in the beginning in the Exodus? In Exodus chapter 12, he said you can't eat any leaven thing. Don't eat any leaven. Now, all of us in our wisdom would just take the leaven and put it on a shelf. Or we would just have a big sign on the refrigerator and on the oven and on the fire. Everything says no leaven, no leaven. We would have it everywhere. No leaven. But as long as leaven was accessible, as long as leaven was nearby... And it was able to be used. Somebody could loathe the preparation of the bread and long for that leaven. And as long as it was accessible, the knowledge of it being accessible could then be one step closer to experiencing the leaven. And God said, if you experience the leaven, you're cut off from Israel. The wisdom of God is just to get rid of the leaven. Get it out of the house altogether. Get it away from you so that no one, innocently or otherwise tempted, even has opportunity and access to make the mistake. And so this lust creates this greed, this insatiable desire. This is exactly what happened in the beginning. Brother Branham says in the Easter seal, and I believe I'm skipping uh, at least three or four slides there to the Easter seal. He says every human being comes right back to the same place to make our choice. But that greed that's always been, and he says right and wrong. This is so amazing. Wrong trying to overthrow the right. He says it started in Eden. What did? Greed. And the greed, <coughs> excuse me, the greed of wrong, trying to overthrow the right. It started in Eden and has come down through the ages. It's come down till it's entered into national affairs. It's come down into church affairs. It's come down into home life. Those may be three different ways of trying to say everywhere what greed and the battle between wrong and right and the greed of wrong trying to overthrow that which is right it came down it started in eden it's come through the ages it says greed think of the way he applies this greed trying to rule or ruin trying to overpower push out and we see the thing working everywhere and it always has the same thing trying to overrule or overrun What's doing it? Greed. This desire, as it said, this, uh, the, the cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and, and I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. It's this greed. It's this insatiable desire. It's the desire to want to have more. Greed, it means you're eager to obtain, to have something. What is it the world we're living in? It's a money-loving world. And, and money's taking on a different meaning now. Because when we say money, it's, it's, money is not just in the cash the scratch, the moolah, or whatever it was you want to call it. It wasn't just in the green and the coin and the currency of the country you're living in. Now, to be money-loving can represent many different things that have purchased power. It can be representative now to where you have cryptocurrency. You have things that are, are, not, that are digital. You have things that maybe be in, that are intangible. They become possessions and become assets and have a great vast wealth associated with it. So we can be a money-loving world. We can be a money-loving person. We can be very greedy. And the love of money being the very root of evil that's in our hearts. And you realize now how the Bible could make that conclusion. That the love of money is the root of all evil. And you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and the woman didn't even have a purse. She didn't have a wallet to keep a credit card. There wasn't even a, a, there wasn't even a terminal to make a transaction. But somehow, 
the love of money encompasses something that was sown into mankind in the beginning. Something that was shocked into humanity. Something that humanity has been wrestling with. Something that humanity has been fighting ever since. That comes down to the end and is exhibited in greed and commercialism and, and overzealous capitalism. And all these things that just harbor uh, or that bring a, a bondage and, and uh, harm to so many individuals. It's now climaxed in the age that we're living in. He says it's greed trying to rule and to ruin, overpower and push out. It's an inordinate desire, this greed. It's a craving. It's a longing. And when you read Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, I don't know if I put it up there. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes. That means it was pleasant. ta ava. It means lust. Covetousness in a bad sense when the woman now is greedy the woman now is loving to have something more to have something what she thinks is better to go beyond that curtain of what's being promised on the other side when the woman saw that it was good for food and that it was pleasant covetousness he awakened a lust in her what was it a lust for knowledge that was only going to be satisfied through the lust of experience that's the, that's the age we're living in now. So how, how is it I'm wanting to present this to you? And, and what, what's the point? If that's how innocence was lost, if that's how the, end, the beginning ended, if that's what's brought in sickness and death and co confusion and lies and murders, then it's at its peak now. That tactic, that, that hook within flesh, this challenge that mankind faces. And we've got to recognize then that God has given us the remedy for all that is complicated, for all that is complex. He's given us the remedy to be able to overcome everything that has reached this climax in this age. And he actually spells it out to the Laodiceans. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich in white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy, thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. They, I'm rich, I'm increased with goods, I have need of nothing. But yeah, you're really poor, miserable, blind, and naked. And so what is God's answer? I counsel you. Here's my wisdom. Buy of me gold tried in the fire. Get your gold from me that you may be rich. Get your white raiment from me that you may be clothed and the shame of my nakedness do not appear. And anoint your eyes with the eye salve that I can give that you may actually see. There's, there's the Trinity, the answer, the three answers to the three other three. His gold, His raiment, His wisdom. This is the answer. The counsel of the Lord is the answer to the world's chaos. The counsel to the world is the answer to the world's confusion. You say, Brother Aaron, you're harping on it. You're harping on it. I understand that. I get it. I'm a harp eagle right now. But I'm still an eagle. And I'm, I'm wanting to express this to you. I really do believe with all my heart it is that simple. And as you face your particular challenges, as you have things arising in your life and you're facing situations and you don't know which way to go and you can conspire this and you can try to prepare for that and you try to figure out all the other ways you can bolster your, your opportunity and take advantage of this and take advantage of that, you've got to be resting in Jesus Christ. You've got to come back to the simple truth that the word is right. That you understand the time and the age that you're living in. That there's been a promise given to you that's to lead you and guide you and see you through this complexity so that you can get the, on the other side of it and just rest. And that's what God wanted to get you to. And so it just it, it may seem very empty and shallow just to say, no, it's the counsel of the Lord. It's the wisdom of God. That's the answer to everything that's going on in the world today. But when I say that, it doesn't mean it's not without depth. This word is very deep. It's multifaceted. There's height to it, there's depth to it, there's width to it, there's breadth to it. There's so much to this word, but therein lies your answer. Amen. Proverbs 19, 21, there are many devices in a man's heart. What is that? Inventions, perceptions, calculations, thoughts, instincts. Many devices, many values, many judgments, many things that have been sown into mankind. They've sought out many inventions, meddled with many questions. That's what caused a man to go to straight. The complicated man, the complicated heart has created a complicated world, a non-innocent world. But nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. Amen. Now, what, 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 is, what is raised in the contrast by using this language? The devices in our hearts lead to failure. 
Relying upon the devices in our hearts lead to things that crumble underneath us, that don't last, that don't give us the joy and the contentment that we think they will. But the counsel of the Lord, it says, that shall stand. He's wanting to bring this competition between something that stands versus something that strays or fails. The counsel of the Lord stands. It'll uphold you. It'll work. But the deceitfulness of our heart and the, and the devices in our hearts, it leads us to stand in places that ultimately cause us to wander or they ultimately fall out from underneath us, and that's what leads to failure. And the anxiety that we face, the things that we go through, the stress that we feel, the depression we fight with, the dissatisfaction, our longing for more comfort, the longing for more communication, the longing to have certain things and begin to find it in the world, it's the product of the accumulation of complications. Things just building, the stress, the confusion we face, it's the accumulation of complications that, we have, been, that have been brought by knowledge and by experience. And we will only, we will only find rest in the Word. It's the only place you'll find it. You'll only be able to make sense of the world through the wisdom of the world. I may, I may be able to pick up on this on Sunday. I was wanting maybe to continue, discontinue uh, this particular naming convention of now it's complicated. And I really would like to get into things that are very practical on how we can simplify our lives from a Word perspective. Taking the revealed word of the hour and simplifying our lives. What for, Brother Aaron? So that we can get out of here? Yeah. Right. So that we don't need gatherings like this anymore? I say, are you still looking for a building? Yeah, I'm looking for a body. It's called a new one. And that if we can focus on that objective, who knows, maybe we don't need a new building. Because the new body gets here first. And so we want to, I want to, by God's grace, perhaps share things that are very practical that we can apply in our daily lives that will enable the word of God to have preeminence so that we can see the word being effective in our lives. And I may be able to bring some of these other things into it and share some of these other things. But I wanted to use just some examples in the word and some examples how that a lot of information without proper wisdom or analytics is useless or leads to a greater problem than if you didn't have any information. And so you could have a lot of data but without the ability to properly analyze it and get value out of it and benefit from it, the data can either be nothing or very, very damaging. And more people have gotten into bigger trouble because they gained a little bit of knowledge than even if they had just been ignorant. And the information age and the Google age that we live in sometimes just gives us just enough information to be dangerous. And that's why we can say, I can handle this. I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night. Right? We've gained just a little bit of an advantage by Googling, and we feel that we're up to the task, and I can figure this out, and I know what to do when we've abandoned our faith in God. We venture into areas that we ought not to venture into, but it's only through the Word of God, through the wisdom of God, that we can make sense of this world. Let me, if you could, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30. I'm going to try to find a way just to bounce through this real quick to close. Think of it this way. The woman in the beginning, right, we're, we're using the phrase, was offered complication through knowledge. And through the question and the lie, she's actually brought to the door of death. And she's enticed to enter. And I, I, really, I admit, I'm using my language that fits within the, the construct of the sermons that I've been preaching. So it, it fits very nicely, kind of settles in real well with what I've been saying over the last three services. But I have the luxury of doing that because I'm the one preaching the fourth one. But I do want you to ponder that, though, that in that, in that way, to think of how that Satan, through a question and a lie, brought the woman to the door of death and enticed her to step into that death. That's what happened in the end of the beginning. Now in the end. Now in the end, what is going to take place? In the end, what's being offered to us in the end through simplicity, not complication, but simplicity is being offered to us through revelation. A word of God is being offered to us. So just as the woman through a question and a lie was brought to knowledge and then a lust for experience was brought to the door of death, now in the end, a very simple word through revelation, the revealed word is bringing a woman to the door, not of death, but life. And we're not, we're not so much trying to be enticed to go in, but we have a 
Spirit of God that's driving us into that place. And the contrast of the end of the beginning and now the ending of the church ages and the ending of time brings us to this great beautiful door that is set before us to where now we, are gain- we have entrance that's being ministered unto us. And just as the woman stood at the door of death and was enticed to step in, we have the privilege of being brought back to simplicity by the revealed word to be set in before the door of life with a desire to step into it. And that life means something very different than what this life wants to tell you that it is. Because this entire world, all of its commerce, all of its societies, all of its economies, all of its politics, all of its religions have become a maze. All of it. All of it has become a maze. And it's sad to say that even this message, which I believe to be the absolute truth, has become complicated and a maze. Who done it? Man done it. And people look at it and they say, I didn't didn't do anything for me. I just kept running into a, a dead end. Who put that dead end there? Man did. Who put them in that maze? Who put them in that collar? Who put them in that bondage? Man does that. But this word of God, it perfectly blends in harmony with the scripture of God. And I feel this confidence that all commerce, all economies, all politics, all religion, all these denominations, every idea, every theology, it's become a maze. And if you sat here today and you purposed in your heart that the only way that I'm going to be able to achieve happiness is to somehow be able to figure things out through the philosophical idea of resolving complexes, things that are complex and resolving things that are challenges and figuring everything out. And I'm going to start from a blank slate. I don't know anything that's right. So I'm going to figure everything out. And through that pursuit of finding truth and figuring everything out, I'll achieve nirvana and I'll be satisfied. And where are you going to start? Think about all the things you have to figure out. All the ways of life, all the ways of living. There's people that tell you, you know where I found simplicity? I found it on a mountaintop. I love to, I love to climb mountains, and I'm just living on the side of a hill, and, and it's simply guarding, and it's simply doing this. and You're going to have to pursue all these things. How could you ever do it? What does that mindset even set before you? How are you going to figure out everything in the world and find, kind of begin to find the place where you belong? I think we can just cut to the chase. God is in control of this. As it says in Deuteronomy chapter 30, I believe we we started with verse 6, but I I only want to reference it to say this. He says, I'll circumcise your heart. Now, immediately that should get our attentions. He's going to circumcise my heart. That means he's going to change this heart of mine. He's going to give me a different heart. He's going, to put his, he's going to give me a new birth, which is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to circumcise your heart. And then he says, the heart of thy seed. That's a promise I believe we should be holding to today as parents. Amen. That we don't just give up and say, well, whatever will happen, but believe that we've been given a promise. And it says that thou mayest live. Not just that you might you know, get through life. Not that you would just have breath, but notice how he begins to describe what it means to have life. Let's look at verse 8. You shall return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command to thee this day. And the effect of walking in his commandments, it makes thee plenteous in every work of thy hand, in the fruit of thy body, in the fruit of thy cattle, in the fruit of thy land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good. It brings me back to the very view that God had of the man and the woman in the beginning. It is very good as he rejoiced over thy fathers, as he rejoiced over creation, as he rejoiced over the man and the woman in the beginning. He said, it is very good. Now God is saying that once I have circumcised your heart and you walk with me and obey my voice and obey my commands, this is when you're really going to have life. This is when you're really going to begin to live. For this commandment, He's talking about how if you will hearken to the voice of the Lord, keep his commandments and his statutes, thou return to the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul. Verse 11, for this commandment which I command thee this day. Think of this. It is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. Think of what we've had the privilege of receiving in this hour. The word is not far away from us. We're not left with all the questions of 62. We're not left with all the wonderings of 1906. We're not left with all the philosophies of our forefathers. We have been set before us today. It is not hidden from us. It's not afar off. We don't need to have someone go into heaven who can find it and bring it down to us so we can hear it and do it. It's already happened. Neither is it beyond the sea that one would go over the sea for us and find it and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Listen, God has sent the word to us. We have received it. So he says in verse 15, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. It's the very thing that was set before the man and the woman. Life and good and death and evil. 
in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. Verse 17 contains the curse if they do not follow it. As we run out of time, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. And it's not just a reference to the expiration of breath, but enjoy life. To have life more abundantly. To have a life that's worth living. To have a reason to live. That regardless of what someone's estate would be and regardless of where they would be, they would have this contentment that have purpose in living. This is true for those that would live in Phoenix or those that would live in Zimbabwe, those that would live in South Africa, those that would live in even some impoverished place. If they live in India and they're not on the, they're at the very bottom of the caste system, whether it be someone who's dirt poor or rich, if they can come to this place to have chosen the good part, to find the one thing that is necessary, it gives you purpose and reason to live. It'll get you out of bed in the morning. And he's saying that if you will do this and cleave to him, he says in verse 20, for he is thy life in the length of thy days. The one thing that is needful, the one thing that is necessary, he is our life. So I'll I'll just sum it up in this and I'll share this as I close. And, and, And if we want to bring in some of these things that we've skipped, I believe the Lord will just find a way to weave it in later. In the beginning, there was one God There was one garden, there was one world, there was one man, there was one woman, and there was one word to keep. That's what it was. And Brother Bram said they had God's word and kept it. They were alive and safe in God's Eden with no death around them at all. And had they kept that one word, had they kept the word that God had given them, we would all be living in the perfect Eden today. Amen. Had they kept it, I just believe I would have come forth. I believe my family would have come forth. And today we'd be living in a perfect paradise without any imperfection. But Brother Bram said Satan got Eve to listen to the gospel of theology, the gospel of knowledge, higher schooling, higher ethics, better civilization, higher education, and so forth. Then when he got her to stop and listen to him a minute to his reasonings. Stopping to listen is what brought in, he says, the gospel of theology, the gospel of knowledge, the gospel of a higher schooling, higher ethics, better civilization, higher education. What is it? More, more, better, better, but contrary to the best that God had given. It may be better to your understanding, but it can't be better than the best. And this fall is still deeply rooted in all of our wanderings, all of our confusions, all of our perplexities, this fall, when the woman, the woman listened to this false gospel in the beginning, this still resides very deeply within our humanity. Because God had given them, and it's beautiful the way Deuteronomy sets it up, because it's a parallel to what happened in the garden, when it says, I've set before thee this day life and good in death and evil. God had given them a knowledge or a concept of, uh, of he had given them a revelation of life and good. And to some degree, a knowledge of and a concept of evil and death. Because he told them not to eat of the tree which contained evil, because if you ate it, you would die. So God had set before them life and death, good and evil, but he had done it by his word. And then he has this death and evil are even symbolized. Life is symbolized by the tree of life and death is symbolized by the tree of knowledge. And what are they? They're opposites. I hope you're thinking very deeply with me right now to where you live today. Not that you'd be tempted by a snake holding an apple. And not that we're talking about temptation to the original sin. I'm talking about what's the shock that still resides within fallen humanity of how the world will work on you and warp you and cause discontentment and dissatisfaction and makes life so complicated. How that God symbolized what God had given them in the beginning, life and good, death and evil. He had given them their context by the word of God, and these things were opposites. And it was not necessary that the man and the woman experience evil and death. It wasn't necessary that they experience it. It wasn't necessary that they even really know what it was. God had put it in there before them to where they were not even to be. It wasn't necessary that they have it. It wasn't necessary that they know it. And that's why God prohibited it. 
If it had been necessary, God would have gave them opportunity in his time to experience it. Can you just help me a little bit here because I'm trying to close and, and, and I just feel such a, a, a zeal to express this. Think about it, that in the beginning, that when God prohibited the tree of knowledge of good and evil to keep them from death, it was because it wasn't necessary. They didn't have to experience the opposite. If there was the potential for more or something else, it wasn't necessary to further their experience, to have full life, to really understand and to be like God. So God prohibited it because it was excess. God prohibited it because it wasn't efficient. God prohibited it because it wasn't expedient. The prohibition was because it was not necessary for the man or the woman to experience it. And so man ought to have stayed with life. The woman ought to have stayed with that which, that which was good. But what happened? Wonder caught her. I wonder if. And so I, I, I end with this. Choose life that you and your family may live. Choose life. Choose the good part. Choose the one thing that is necessary. You say, how do I do that? Challenge yourself to take a step back from the knowledge and ask yourself, what's necessary? What's needful? Thank you for your attention tonight. Let's stand. Choose life. I want to choose that better part. The best part, the good part, that I may live. I don't, I don't mean that, that I'm afraid of dying, but I want to I live a life that's above the sorrow and, and, and the sadness, the melancholy, the anxiety, the worry, the fear, the dread to where you can be at complete liberty to engage in the things that you know you ought to without all the fears and the complex that inhibit you. It's remarkable how we can know exactly what is right and, and even want to do it, but being given the opportunity, our own emotions paralyze us. And we just find that we can't. It's that dread, that heaviness, that cloud, we can't quite get through it. To even do the things we ought to do with our family, to even enjoy recreation that we otherwise would normally enjoy, we become paralyzed. And so it's not just a matter of, well, I don't want to die tomorrow. I want to do what's right. Choose life that you may live. Be free, free from bondage, free from fear. Free to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit in your life. Free to express Christ without, the, uh, without worrying about what other people are going to say about you. Oh, they're going to think I'm soft or they're going to think I'm doing this. I'm thinking I'm doing that. Just be, be Christ-like. Live the word of God. We shouldn't fear about what this word is going to produce. Let it produce what it's going to produce. If somehow they want to start telling you, oh, well, you're getting off track and you believe in this and you believe that and, and you're, you have less of this and less of that. Say, I just want the word to have preeminence. Let God, let God have control. So I choose life tonight. I've been pondering that scripture. As for me and my house, as for me and my house, that, it's the only thing I have control over. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's what we're going to do. We're going to choose life. As for me and my house. Our gracious Heavenly Father, tonight as we close this service, as we dismiss your people, we pray, Lord, that you would sum up these lengthy things. Some may describe it as just a lengthy narrative, a TED talk, or just a speech. But Lord, those would just be aspersions being cast on a supernatural word. Those would just be the critis critis criticisms of a, a, a man with his own complexes or a woman who's who's struggling with their own weaknesses to cast uh, any kind of dispersion or any kind of discreditation on these things which are expressed. For Lord, they came from the Word. I believe they are the Word of God. And though they may have a little bit of my own flavor and my own uh, uh, manner of delivery, Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit take the, the, the substance of what was expressed tonight, place it within the heart and the minds of your people today, and may it bring forth good fruit, Lord. 
Lord, we are challenged on every side. We are bombarded on every side. We're afflicted in every arena of life, health and mind and wealth and possessions and directions and profession, Lord. It's, it's, it's everywhere, Lord, we're being, just as we could just express it this way, Lord, if the whole world one day politically and militarily will turn upon Israel to beset them on every side, as it were, with guns and nuclear weapons, and it would be political chaos and political pressure and uh, military pressure and the might and the economies and the politics and social pressures and everything would come upon Israel naturally one day, Lord. That's what we're facing today. Without the military, without the national identity, but in our spirits and in the warfare that we face, Lord, we're beset, we're pressed. Everything's crushing in upon us. And Lord, if we're trying to scramble upon our walls to figure out ways to keep the enemy at bay and fire this and fire that and put out this fire and, lay, and take care of this and take care of that, Lord, we get so stretched out along all our walls to where our defenses begin to wane. And somewhere, somehow, the devil gets to us. Lord, tonight I want to retreat into your presence. And I'll hide myself in that rock. And I want to be simple towards your promise that I want to believe you and take you at your word. And I do not want, Father, to make the mistake of trying to do these things on my own and figure it out, engaging and wrestling with questions and scenarios. Lord, how many times have we been robbed of our peace? Because we in our own minds begin to indict a matter and think about it and ponder it and figure it out and see if it, would, see if it happens this way, if it happens that way. And in doing so, Lord, we just leave ourselves with more fear. Lord, may we just take the Rubik's Cube of life and give it back to you. Say, Lord, when you gave it to me, it was, it was perfect. All I had to do is just enjoy the, its beauty. But I've twisted it up in so many different ways, Lord, I can't figure it out. Would you, Lord, just take the Rubik's Cube of my life make it all fit that's our prayer tonight Lord as we cry unto you tonight Lord we're choosing life as for me and my house we'll just simply serve you and I know there's a lot that that means but I just want to serve you bless your people tonight and Lord I pray that you be you just be a present Lord I pray help us commit ourselves to you as we always do Lord bless us as we are dismissed soon in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.